Guys, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Advisory Board Podcast, where we bring in experts in the franchising space uh, to give you actionable, real-world advice that will help you avoid some of the common mistakes and really build a, a successful franchise brand. And I, I got to be honest, I'm super excited today to have John with me. If you guys don't know John Hewitt, uh, I got to tell you why I know John. Uh, I was <clears throat> I was bouncing out in the hall at, at, in a springboard conference, and I saw this you know handsome old gentleman sitting by himself, and so I sat down next to him and just said, "Hey." And I didn't know who he was at the time. I, you know, I, I'm still a fairly newbie to franchising. He's actually been in franchising 10 times longer than I have almost. But um, and so we started talking. He's like, Jackson, you know, I'm, you know, I'm John Hewitt. And I was like, oh, cool. And I was like, wait. And he started telling me about tax. I'm like, not like Jackson Hewitt. And he just kind of smiled at me like, I'm surprised you don't know yet. But uh, it was but not like in an arrogant way. It was like super like just chill. Like we had a fun conversation. And then I realized in the conversation, I was talking to a bit of a legend so uh, the one thing I've always loved about John is that you're you're understated for who you are, and you're not screaming for showbiz time and headlines and PR articles and and time on stage. And I actually really love and respect that about you, which I also think makes your advice a lot more uh, consumable. You know, people like to hear from people who who are honest and uh, and aren't trying to pump themselves up all the time. So, uh, but for those of you who don't know John, let me tell you about about why you should care about what he's got to say today. We're going to talk today about why franchise brands fail. And John uh, is, but his background has been very laden with success, but you fell along the way. And that's why John, I think has such a good perspective on this. He's he's the great granddaddy of, of tax and of tax preparation in this country. He's founded two of the top 100 franchise brands ever made. Uh, no one's ever done that before. Uh, he's, he's worked with an onboard of 5,300 franchise owners, over 11,000 territories in his tenure. He's been in franchising for 55 years, He's also a great grandpa of five kids, so uh, it shows his tenure on this planet's also been a little bit, uh, it's, it's extended, and we're grateful to have you here, John. So tell us just a little bit about, about yourself, a little bit about loyalty. Oh, by the way, CEO, founder, chairman of Loyalty Brands, and they're about to go, they're about to have a three-peat of another super successful franchise brand to hit the top 100, right, John? So tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'll stop hyping you, and then we'll jump into that topic together. Sure. I think I can cover my 55 years in about three minutes. I started 1969 working at h and Block, loved it. Uh, 12 years later, I was running 250 locations and having the time of my life, 30 years old. And my dad decided we should computerize taxes. And he was the CFO of a public company. So in 1981, we both quit our jobs and built the first tax software for an Apple computer. That computer sold, it's in the Smithsonian, it's an antique. And it's over, it's 50 years old. So we couldn't, no one wanted it way ahead of its time and got lucky and found a company here in Virginia Beach called Mel Jackson Tax Service. Mel had died. We bought six offices from his widow and H&R Block had 9,000 offices. We set about to be bigger than H&R Block. So we just needed to open 8,995 offices. <laughs> well, um, we opened over the next 15 years, we went public, we changed the name to Jackson Hewitt, we merged the co computer company and the tax company, and we sold it for $483 million. I um, had a non-compete that lasted for three years. By the way, it went on to become a billion-dollar company. So so Jackson Hewitt was a billion-dollar company. And, and um, now they have 6,000 offices, 23rd largest franchise chain in the country. And... I had to start all over again in 1998. I had a, my not compete didn't cover Canada because Jack Snew had never gone to Canada. I grew up in Buffalo, so I knew the Canadian tax system. I did Canadian taxes and Jack Snew had never gone there. So we opened Liberty Tax in Canada. And within three years, now I found in one of the top 100 in retail chains in Canada. Mm -hmm. So now there's only one company that had ever competed successfully nationally against H&R Block, and I did it in both countries, Jackson Hewitt in U.S., Liberty Tax in Canada. Came back to the United States in 2000, and now it was a little more challenging because I had to change, I had to compete with thousands of Liberty Tax, I'm sorry, Jackson Hewitt, mm -hmm. in addition to H&R Block. And yet, not only did we grow faster than Jackson Hewitt, we grew faster than them and h &R Block combined, we opened 4,000 offices in 12 years, almost one per day. Okay. It's unheard of, not only 
Only about 10 companies have ever done come close to that in the history of franchising. So I was top 10 history of franchising. Uh, my second public company, my second company worth $500 million, my second public company, and um, sold it, and then went on to start Loyalty Brands. Mm -hmm. Unlike, unlike um, Jackson Hewitt and Liberty, uh, we have numerous brands. We have eight different brands. And unlike those, those are just focused in one industry. Now I have three focuses. One focus is, like always, tax and accounting. Mm -hmm. And our ATAX, which is going to be a fourth national tax brand, is that growing faster than any of the other top three. I've always done that. And uh, we have our construction company, only two years old, headed by roofing, solar, and siding. That's top 10% fastest growing two-year-old franchise in the country. Mm -hmm. So that looks, I, I love that industry. The, the cost of a roof is average 25,000 versus a tax term that's $250. And so it's a lot bigger ticket. But I really, the, the love that I've, I've seen that it's growing exponentially in 37 months, we're already number one in the country in mobile grooming, pet grooming. We have um, that, we will have, uh, we're number one, we're top, 25 out of 4,000 franchisors were already in the top 25 fastest growing. And within five years, we should have 3,000 vans across the country. We should be my third household name. So I have, in, in five years, I have three household names. I have Jackson Hewitt, Liberty Tax, and Zoom and Grim. Wow. Well, that, and that's a that's a very quickly growing space too, the uh, the mobile grooming uh, world. Everything, everything. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, can, first of all, congrats. I mean, I know you're, you're not here to beat your chest, but but it's kind of fun, I'm guessing, at your, where you're at in life to look back and be like, okay, we've, we've accomplished some pretty cool things to, uh, in this space. Uh, so I just want to, you know, hats off, John, for, for the hard work. But uh, the, the, today, the purpose of today's conversation is actually kind of a tough conversation to talk about what, what's making franchises fail. And you mentioned a stat to me. I wonder if you would, if you wouldn't mind sharing it again, sharing just like the stark realities of franchising, like how many of these brands actually succeed. And then we're going to talk about what, what, what are some of the causes you've seen over 55 years in franchising that are causing brands to not be successful. You mind sharing kind of the, the preamble for that, John? I really didn't pay a lot of attention to these numbers and while I was with either Jackson Newman and Liberty because I was focused on my brand. I wasn't focused on how many franchisors were starting up and failing each year. But over the last uh, six years, we've looked at 100 different concepts mm -hmm. and we partnered with uh, about 20 and I've divorced 12 of them. And so I, I did never realize the danger uh, that of this in, of franchise. I've always thought it is a greatest vehicle. In fact, I did a webinar recently for an hour on why you should buy a franchise versus be a mom and pop. Mm -hmm. So I mean that it's, but it's only if it's a quality franchise. Right. And and so I've learned I've learned some lessons as to when when people think. And and I guarantee there are thousands of people in the United States right this second that are thinking about, I'm thinking about, you know what, I'm thinking about being a franchise. I'm thinking about, you know, I have this great mom and pop business. And why don't we go national? Why don't I go national and be a national name and spread spread the joy and help other people and, and make a lot of money by being a franchise? There are thousands of people that are thinking about that. So my first answer is if you came to me and you had a concept and said, well, what do you think, John? Should I franchise? I, my first thing would be don't. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Why? Why? Why is that? Because that's from a guy yeah. who was franchising. Well, that seems like the opposite response I think people would expect to hear. Yeah, there's three major reasons why franchisors fail. And, and there's three huge barriers to entry that people don't think about when they, they start it because they they just think it's the next step. And and er, every person I've met that wants to franchise is cock. They're successful, right? Yeah. Whether it's a successful pet store or contractor, roofing contractor or food, they have some food 
um, uh, service, some some restaurant or whatever they have. They mm-hmm. they have been cocky and successful, and they're making they're making six figures. Yeah, a few of them seven, but most of them six figures, mm-hmm. and they're pretty. You know, they're pounding their own chest. They're feeling good about themselves, and they what what happens though is that I've seen, and these are the reasons people fail. Number one, they, every one of them that I've ever met has a very successful business and yet they need the income to live the style of life they're living, right? They haven't yet saved up enough money to be, to have, to be able to write checks for a million dollars, right? I mean, they may have a net worth of millions, but they don't have the cash of me. Yeah. And so they're making, let's pretend you were an entrepreneur and making $300,000 a year. And that's pretty good. You're That puts you in the top 5% of all Americans. Mm-hmm. And usually you're less than 50 years old, um, sometimes in the 30s, but mostly a median age is about 40, 35 to 45. And you said, you know, I can, I can do this. I can, I can really, you know, grow this thing and be huge and national. Others have. John Hewitt did it. I mean, Henry Block did it. Ray Kroc did it. Uh, Colonel Sanders did it. I mean, Pizza Hut did it, and Prophet Johns. And I mean, everyone's doing it. Why? I mean, does it sound so complicated? Because yeah. I have this great system. Well, what happens though is number one problem is they need the revenue from their current business to pay the bills for the next three to five years because no franchisor starts up year one and is successful you have you have significant startup costs Mm -hmm. call it call it including advertising call it three to five hundred thousand dollars and then you don't get a return on that until you begin getting franchisees in who are paying royalties and the royalties on you and there's they have a startup and some of the startup periods like in our in our um storefront grooming the typical startup period is eight or nine months before mm-hmm. they get the first dollar yeah. so it's going to be a while before you get franchise and they're not going to mature the, the minute they open so i need to keep my day job while i'm building the franchise system well already you're not a good competitor because your your focus is mixed yeah. yeah and your real focus no matter what you think it's you're always biased to what's paying the not only what's paying the day to day bills, but that's your baby. Yeah, you you've owned it for five years, ten years, mm-hmm. typically ten to twenty years. You've been in this business. This is your baby. These your staff, your dozens of employees, or hundreds of employees. Those are your like your children, and and that's where your heart is. And now we have this new new enterprise that sounds good, but I just don't have full time. So. I get to, when I'm doing it full time, John Hewitt, I get to compete against the new entrepreneur on the block who's, he's got a foot in both camps and he has zero experience at being a franchisor, zero. And so number one is the, the very talented person is diluted. Yeah. Right. I mean, think if you, you played baseball for uh, the Yankees and, and then during the day you were a postman. You had another forty-hour job. I mean, I mean that doesn't make sense. It'd be hard, right? I mean, yeah. right. So, yeah. number one, the person's the loop. Number two is, it's a whole different animal managing a franchise system. Yeah. Franchisees, are, they're not like employees. In fact, they're they're renegade beyond belief. Mm-hmm. And the people that step out and being self-employed in this world is the minority. And they're typically the best minority in many ways in the way that I respect them and that they're innovators and creative and changing the world. And, and they, they think outside the box. They're the kind of people that I enjoy being around that are go-getters and, um, but they're not pushovers, yeah. right? They're not, they're not submissives. <laughs> I mean, a, a owner of a business is typically not submissive, mm-hmm. right? There and so you're now you're dealing so you get five or ten franchisees, and most of them are good and on your side and on your team, but even the good ones are going to be aggravated once in a while or upset or something mm-hmm. went wrong and it's never their fault. It's always my fault, 
right? Even the best are, are going to be aggravated. But the worst, the worst who won't listen to you, and I brought in 5,300 people, and the key to being a, a great franchisee is my job is to give you the greatest system. Your job is to listen. <laughs> well, they've not, not one person's ever listened to 100%. And yet when they fail or something goes wrong, they still blame me and they say, I did everything you said. No, you didn't. You're lying through your teeth. You're lying. Maybe you're lying to yourself, but you're certainly lying to me. And so they don't listen and they're renegades. And it's different than managing dozens of corporate employees that you can fire, you can hire, you can tell them to shut up. You can't tell a franchisee to shut up. They wear many hats between customer, partner, friend, family. The, the franchisee franchise or relationship is very, uh, it, to me, they're like my children. Mm -hmm. So when I brought in 5,300, I have like 5,300 children. Yeah. So, so that's the second part is they're just not good at. And what I've seen out of all of the franchisors I've dealt with since I started loyalty brands who want to join me mm -hmm. because they love, they love that I can help them grow and that, that we can grow exponentially. And I have grown exponentially. I mean, virtually no one's done what I've done and I can help them. But um, even though they should listen, they don't listen. And so um, they're just 95% of them, the people I meet that want to franchise or even do franchise should yeah. not be, be CEO. They need to get a new CEO in there for two reasons. Number one is they're not good at it. That's not their expertise. And uh, they're not diluted. If mm -hmm. you're diluted... Yeah. I mean, the new person you put in there, you can't afford, but you can't afford a great person because you, your income the first year as a franchisor is a few hundred thousand. A great person is going to cost you a few hundred thousand. Yeah. So it's a it's a catch-22, chicken or egg. And so yeah. there, that's, that's reason number two. The third reason is almost beyond belief to me. And it's so because it's so simple. And that is, and, and at my last company at Liberty Tax, we painted it on the wall in huge letters when you walked in. So whenever an employee walked in the door of corporate headquarters or a franchisee, first thing they see in big letters on the wall is happy, successful franchisees. Now, you would think that would be automatic. You would think that, okay, I'm a new franchisor, that if I have happy, successful franchisees, mm -hmm. then um, I, can't ever, I can't ever help but grow exponentially. Right. And at, at Liberty, we open we open over 300 stores a year for for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an amazing growth. But if you have happy, successful franchisees, then which is successful means return on investment of both time and money, then you can't fail. They will propel you to greatness. And if you don't, you can't win. You can't succeed. And yet every franchisor with the help of their skilled franchise attorneys, draw up an agreement that's onerous, that protects you. The attorney's going to protect you from these franchisees that are supposed to be your partner and so forth. So they build onerous rules and fees. And yeah, why not charge them? Why don't I charge them a fee? If I, if I sell them a product, I'll get 5% of that. And if I, um, they have to pay part of the brand advertising to, I mean, I want McDonald's to be a national name. So they got, I want this to be a national name. So why not make them pay for that? Why not make them pay this and that? And, and they should pay to come to the convention. They should pay an application fee. And they don't, at the end of the day, they put on so many fees, the franchisee can't succeed. Yeah. And, and so it's uh, most, franchisors 80 percent of franchisors that started 10 years ago are gone wow and nine years ago 80 percent are gone and most 80 percent that start this year in 10 years will be gone because of those three basic things yeah well and i want to dive a little bit deeper into some of these with you john but uh, i just want to make sure we reiterate that statistic so in 10 years 10 years 80 percent of all the franchises that are started today will be gone right. Which, which is something we don't talk about a lot. I mean, compared to <clears throat> like standalone businesses, it's got a higher success rate. What is that one? Like 85% in the first five years fail or something like that. It's it's a pretty big number. So In five years, 95% are not open. In, if okay. you don't count in just in the statistics over the last, 
in the 21st century. 95% of businesses that open, all businesses, including a few franchisors, mm. 95% do not make it five years. Yeah. So, I mean, in perspective, it's better, right? But but it's also, we have to address that that as successful as franchising is, uh, and as and as successful as it can be when done right, there are these these three big things get in the way of brands being successful, and uh, and that's where I, I want to go back to a couple of things you said, John. I want I want to just like dive a little deeper here. We talked about the diluted effort challenge of the franchise franchise new franchisor, right? Where they're always looking at the baby. The we we talked a little bit about this, but I want to I want to share. I want you to, if you don't mind, maybe share some experience of um, how. How does this cash flow pinch truly impact the decision making of the of the brand owner? And a lot of people that listen to this, they're emerging franchisors, where they're right in the middle of this now. How are they going to recognize if they've got a problem that they're focusing too much energy on the baby, their original business versus the, being a franchisor CEO? Because we see that a lot, and it creates a lot of angst in the in the in the system. But how will they know? Because a lot of them are like, I can do it, I can do it, but they probably are failing, and they don't maybe know it. Uh, can you share some insights into into what you've seen there? Yeah, I mean, there's hundreds of examples, and there's a few big examples. So let's say that you're in the mobile dog grooming business like me, okay. right? And you decide you, you're successful. You have this, this successful business with like, um, I, the last one I saw that, one of the last one that got into the industry, they they had about five locations. Mm -hmm. And they look around and they see everyone is charging a franchise fee of forty thousand dollars. So now they have they have five locations that are company locations and they're all in their one region. And so they were doing very well, making four hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And they decide they're gonna charge forty thousand dollars. Okay. So, I mean, think about that. If if you had a chance, and let's say that that you were going to compete with H and R Block, right? And yeah. um, you have Dave's Tax Service. Now there are nine thousand H and R Block, mm -hmm. right? How right. many? And there are there's one or five call it five Dave's Tax Service, right? Sure. All in in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. So now you sell a franchise in Illinois. And H and R Block, let's say H and R Block could get forty thousand. Why are you worth forty thousand? Yeah, the, the minute you put up a sign that says H and R Block, 80 percent of the people have heard of you. Right. They know who you are. Mm -hmm. Right. No one's ever heard of Dave's Tax Service. I guess how long it's going to take you in Chicago, Illinois, to gain a market market name that that 80 percent of the people are going to have known about you that 10 20 years it's going to take right years. exactly so it's not worth forty thousand. Yeah. yeah it's not worth forty thousand. it's not it's a jackson you it's not a jackson you it's not a liberty tax it's not an h and r block a day's tax service yeah. so but you don't understand that mentally you you're not you don't get it that the franchise so so say it a different way right yeah when if I open up in the first year, a a good franchisor, a good one, will have five to 10 units. Uh -huh. And the second one, a good one, uh, uh, now an exceptional one will triple to 15. Mm -hmm. An exceptional one will triple again to 45. But okay, so when I have five name brands in the country and everyone else in the industry that has hundreds or thousands, like H and R Block has nine thousand locations. They have nine thousand. Is it worth the same amount? Mm -hmm. And then if I have five or fifteen or forty-five, once I have a thousand units, I have. Isn't it worth more if I have a thousand units than if it's I have five? Well, I'd say if you better have better infrastructure support, marketing, internal tools at that point, right? So yeah, I'd say yeah. How can you? H and R Block has a billion dollars in the bank. They just filed their, in August, they filed their quarterly or their yearly numbers. They have a billion dollars in the bank. Well, I even as successful as I have, I have many millions in the bank, but I don't have a billion dollars. I can't compete with that. How are you going to beat them? 
And so what they do is they don't charge less because they're not big enough yet. Mm -hmm. And they can't possibly have the manpower, the software, right. the name recognition. When you, if, if you're competing against the brand name and you put a new office in Kansas City, Missouri, you're the first Dave's tax service ever in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Think of the uphill battle you face. That person needs a lot of extra help. But as a franchisor, if I if he's not paying me, how am I getting any money? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, how am I getting any revenue from the guy? If I have to spend it all on building up his brand name in that market, I got one unit. And so they just don't realize the plight of the new franchisee and the adversity they're facing and the extra money. And they're not going to make money for in most industries for three to five years before they get cash flow significant cash flow positive so they need help they need they need funding they need uh, extra marketing they need a system that has differentiators and so they don't they don't put themselves in the shoes of the franchisee and the adversity they're going to face so here's what i did for example even though i had founded jackson unit right and it was a billion dollar company yeah and they had they had six thousand offices Right. And H and R Block had nine thousand. Well, John Hugh is pretty successful, right? He he's founded a billion dollar company. He's the biggest and there was no blocks with H and R Block since 1995. So I come into the United States in 2000 with Liberty Tax. So this is what I did. First year, they're all free. You can get a franchise for free. Hmm. And so just a twenty five hundred dollar deposit. Now Jackson Hugh it was and Block was sold out. Jackson knew it was 25000 a territory. And we said it's free the first year. Now I can live off my success, my name, and the fact that I have a better system. And we grew to about 80 stores. Well, the next year, now we have some growth. And we get, okay, he's doing it again. So now we raised it to 10000 mm -hmm. And my goal back then was, was thinking my when I first started in the United States competing with Jackson Hewitt and HR Block, I was going to go 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, all the way up to 40. Well, um, they were doing the second year we went to 10,000. And and we sold 150 territories. Huh. And we were going faster than Block and Jackson Hewitt combined. And so I said, okay, let's go to 25. Third year I thought we raised the beat at 25. And now we sold 200 territories. And then the fifth year, we went to 40,000 and we averaged 250 to 300 new territories a year. But we started with zero, went to 10. Went, as soon as I could, saw the momentum, then you can raise the fee. Then you have that when you have happy, successful franchisees who are touting you and loving you and expanding, then you can increase. But they don't start. They start at 40. And heaven forbid that anyone asks for financing. Yeah. Right. And so when you when you have a friend, when you start a business, you need either either money or I mean, you need money and management a bill. And yeah. it's a, it's it's a lot easier for me to get money than great managers. And so we provided a lot of over the years, provided hundreds of millions of dollars of lending to our franchisees. Most of it in the tax business was seasonal to get from May until January. Yeah. But most don't do that. They, oh, heaven forbid that I finance them, that mm -hmm. I waive my franchise fee and finance the franchise. Heaven forbid. If they can't afford to do it, then then go away, go somewhere else. You know, it's funny, John. I, I'm in a unique position when I where I talk to a lot of brands, emerging and established. But I've, I was having a conversation last week with a brand that's about to launch and launch with a fury. There's a really cool concept, lots of money behind it good executive team. And, uh, and I asked them like, well, why don't you consider financing the, the, the growth of each location? Uh, and, and I find that like, it's really cool that you mentioned that because as a franchisor, I see a lot of indications. My wife and I bought some franchises and, but sometimes when you're evaluating franchise brands, you see indications that the franchisor doesn't have pure total confidence that the franchisee is going to be successful so they kind of hold back things they they you can see that they're building like a little safety net around around a failure and 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 you know legally you kind of need to be prepared for that but that shouldn't be the, the posture of the business and so uh 
and and that we had a really good conversation about it. You know what? If you're if you believe this model is going to work, then you ought to believe well enough to put your own money where your mouth is if you're big enough to do that and help finance the the franchisee success in in a legal way, of course. But but uh, I love that you brought that up because it's the ultimate sign to me that the franchisor believes in the model. If I were looking at it for the franchisees, oh, he's going to finance this. Uh, I know they can make more money marginally that way too, but it's a long play. You're not going to get your money out of a finance for five, 10 years. So uh, you're expecting there to be a long-term growth and commitment from my end as well. Seems like a real good partnership at that point while still following joint employer rules, right? But um, yeah, those those things, they turn me off a little bit uh, as somebody who's coaching franchise brands regularly or chatting with them. I, I, I hate to see the... Um, like you said, building up the legal walls, agreements that have way too many fees, or some franchisors make mistakes and buy technology that's crazy expensive. And then there's a big burden. A franchisee to operate day one has to spend, you know, four thousand dollars of cash a month just to operate and without even selling a single single job. Like that's a little bit ridiculous to me. So agreed. And yeah. and one thing that that may surprise everyone is that. It shouldn't. And when you think about it, because I've had only only 10 percent of the people that have joined me had a had a net worth of over five hundred thousand oh, and wow. probably probably 50 percent or 30, 40, 50 percent had a net worth of under one hundred thousand. And wow. guess who did better? The people that had a net worth of over five hundred thousand or the people that had a net worth of under a hundred thousand. Oh, I bet money on the, the hundred thousand because they're hungry. exactly exactly because their season American dream. The richer you are, you're looking for a return on investment. And you're not. Most people I found get complacent. And uh -huh. the richer the richer you are, the more complacent you are. The the less, the less uh, you're not gonna go all in. You know, if I'm worth five million dollars and I invest two hundred thousand in a franchise, then I'm not all in. No. But if I have two hundred thousand, invest two hundred thousand in a franchise, I'm all in. And so I, I learned, you know, there there's a phrase called skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And that to every human being, that means, I think, um, money invested. To me, I've changed. That's one of the unique philosophies I have. I have about 30 unique philosophies. And I don't believe it's anything to do with money. I, I believe it's the mentality of are you all in or not? Are you all in? Because, if, again, if you're worth, if you're worth fifty thousand dollars and you um, you invest thirty and borrow a hundred, and you're all in, right? But yeah. if the guy that has work that has five million invests five times that, he invests one hundred fifty thousand, he can walk away from that in a minute, and it won't even he won't even have a hardly a bad month. Yeah, that's interesting because in the industry, there's especially young brands. There's this obsession with net worth, like, oh, you got to have the money. You got to be able to get the money. You don't have to have the money today to be a successful franchise owner. And I love that you're drawing a line between those two things. Is uh, It's really a about a psychological commitment to success more than it is about showing up with a bag of cash. Because the guy with the bag of cash it can walk away a lot easier than the guy that said, hey, I'm going to commit 100% into this thing. Right. Yeah, if, if, I have, if I have a bag of cash and only 10 hours a week, or another guy that ha doesn't have very much cash and he's working 90, 100 hours a week. Who do you want? Yeah, who's going to work? Who's going to build the brand faster? Right, I agree. exactly. I agree. Um, you know, that reminds me, uh, just this concept of semi-absentee ownership has popped up so much lately. And it kind of makes my skin crawl a little bit because I see brands that are promoting that concept and they're not semi-absentee. How, how, how do you look at that concept of semi-absentee owner versus all-in owners? Well, what I have... In, in my industry, in tax industry, the, my 55-year industry, yeah. today there are 300,000 taxpayers in the country. And a third of them work at h and Block, Jackson Hewitt, and Liberty to ATEX, and ATEX, my brand. Yeah. And you know what? So there's 100,000 of them. Guess how many of them want to be self-employed? And they can't, they don't have the money to do it. But they, they've proven themselves. They prove that they love the industry. They know how to, I mean, they, they're they great at customer service. They're great at taxes. They're great at, at all of it. They manage, they could be managing offices or just or, or promoting. And they just need funding. Yeah. So my concept of a semi-absentee owner is to partner the two together. I have someone that has money 
and doesn't have the time, I said, boy, do I have a guy for you. Mm -hmm. Boy, do I have a guy for you. You're in Wichita, Kansas. I got a guy in Wichita, Kansas. And I put them together, meet. And then um, once in a while, not always, but once in a while, they form a great team. And they build it up because because they offset each other's other strengths. Yeah. Well, you said it before, you need money and you need an operator, a good manager right. to be successful as a franchise owner. And you're bringing the two together there. I appreciate that. John, this has been uh, instructive and, and I appreciate you carving out some time with all the things you're trying to juggle, including the grandbabies and great grandbabies and life in general, right? But um, if you could share one last piece of, of kind of a soundbite with folks to, to to know like how what else can they be do to be a successful franchise owner? What else would you share? It's kind of a parting thought today. My general philosophy is find something you love to do. Work hard, persevere. If you on Monday morning you're not going to work, looking forward to it, you're going to the wrong place. So it's thank God it's Monday. If you're living, thank God it's Friday, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And then nothing, everything worthwhile, everything worthwhile requires hard work. And the most, most number one, most important attribute of success in anything, a relationship, business, sports, is perseverance. God knocks all of us down. The winners get up each and every time. Yeah, I'm with you. John, uh, fantastic soundbite. Thanks for thanks for that. Thanks for all the advice you've shared today in your journey. And thanks for being a good example in the industry. I sure appreciate you. Thanks. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot, John.